Hey, Liz. Hi, good Hi. morning. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, good. How's your daughter-in-law? She is well. She did good. not get COVID. Good. Or, and she did test. She tested negative. So yes. doing good. Yeah, thanks. Okay, hey, that's great. What a load. Hey? That's just yeah. such a relief good. for you. Yeah. yeah. Good morning, everybody. Hi there, Ralph. Good to see your face this morning. Yes, nice to be here. How are you feeling today? Oh, it's the same old thing. Uh, try not to take too many pills. Make it, they make you dopier than you are normal in normal life, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I found that to be quite uh, Jones I said snow. Not <laughs> that I'm I'm uh, be dopier than I am normally. <laughs> <clears throat> no, it's it's uh, it's just something I'm gonna have to find the balance and get a medication that doesn't make you groggy. Yeah, uh, it's it's arthritis, and uh, the doctor puts his shoulders in the air, and well, and that's the way it is, and and life goes on, and it does. Like I wasn't expecting any. I was. I was hoping for some something miracle in the way of a of an operation on the back, but that's what I thought. That nerve ablation, which I would caution anybody against doing, I did that, and and they did. They took two cracks at it, and it, it did nothing. Absolutely nothing. So here I am. I'm able to sit in a comfortable chair and and. Uh, and visit with you folks. So good. And I caught part of the the um, mm -hmm. uh, Bible study the other night and found it very enjoyable. My ears perked up when I when I heard the seeds of mustard and mm -hmm. and canola, small seeds, <laughs> and gathering the sheaves and, and uh, <laughs> uh, I took it. Uh, it was it was quite a quite a story. Jesus talks quite a bit about agriculture. He does, yes. Well, you know, when you think about how much people, how much the, how much is, how many people are involved in rural agriculture, feeding the world, they don't just feed our backyard here. My goodness, the grain that's trucked off the prairies by by a train and truck. Is unbelievable, and uh, it's uh, it's nice to see uh, an appreciation of that. I'm going to leave the two of you for just a minute, but I'll be back shortly. Good. Yeah. Hi, Joan. I was so I got your your text the other day, and I'm sorry I didn't answer it. Um, yes, but I did say prayers and I gave great thanks for Lauren getting into nursing. Oh, I, I'm always yeah. very excited when somebody gets into nursing. We need nurses so badly now. That's right. You know, it's, and, for, well, and for them to choose to go into nursing too. Yeah. You know, yeah. she surprised us. Yeah, and it's we so costly, to. you know, and that that prevents a lot of people from going into it too. You know, I think we need you know, to have a serious very, very health. Costly. A serious health care system would be appreciated with respect to wages and working conditions yeah. relative to teachers and um, health care nurses yeah. Uh, yeah. and doctors and all the like. Uh, uh, something serious can be done. I see so much terrible waste in the system. My word. So something needs to be done. Well, I'm so glad she got in, though. Well, that's right. You know, the, the bar is quite high. She had to have an average of 85. Yeah. Oh, it is. It's very high. It was very <laughs> high. Too. Oh. You know, you know, what? The, um, there was well over 5, 400, near to 500 applicants for our class. You know, when I, I got in and I know, too, when I did my refresher course, I think there was 450 applicants for it, and there was only 18 of us that got in. Oh my goodness! Yeah, yeah, it was, and that was the first refresher course they'd had in Alberta. 
So that was that song. I'm just trying to think. That was in the 70s, in the later 70s, you know, 77 around in there. How are you? Wow. Thank you for not leaving me alone. <laughs> the parking lot's getting kind of full out there. We need a volunteer to direct nope. traffic. <laughs> hey, is this Bluetooth you've got? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was looking at it over the glasses. <laughs> I wonder if anyone else will come on with us. Well, it looks like Rosemary and Arnie are coming on. Yeah, I've got them. Good. They're, Good. There cool. we are. There we are. Good morning. Morning. Morning, Arnie. Oh. Morning, Rosemary. She's not here. Oh, here, here she comes. Oh, there she is. I can see her. I was trying to put the sound down. Okay, there you go. I just put my hearing aids in to get the sound. Up. Oh, I haven't got them in. I better put them in. <laughs> I didn't know that Liz had hearing sure aids. Sure well, I'm waiting for this to come on, and it hasn't come on. We can hear you and see you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we have a special. Um, we said we couldn't hear well enough. So Wes came during the week and set up a speaker for us. And I'm trying to connect it and it hasn't worked yet. Did you? Did you oh. Is it working via a Bluetooth or is it hardwired? I think it's Bluetooth. It's Bluetooth. Oh, okay. I can't help I you with that. I don't know what I did wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I think maybe it could be automatic or something because we can really hear you. Yeah, I can hear you fine. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you can hear us, but we don't, it, it, we, it doesn't come through that loud to us. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. Maybe it's better. I don't know. I'll, I'll see what, I'll, 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 he went to look at, see whether the connection is right or not. <laughs> We're always working at things. <laughs> so, Mom, is the speaker on? Yeah, the speaker is on. Morning. So but we set it up in the, in the in the dining room. So now I don't know why why there's no sound coming out. So on the top bar of your computer. Yeah. There's a little. Uh, yeah. Little, yeah, I remember. You see that Bluetooth symbol? Yeah. Did you click on it? Well, it said Bluetooth is off. So turn it on. It, I have, it doesn't come on. Yeah. Do you have the option to turn Bluetooth on? Yeah, or off. The red light comes on if you try to put it on. But it, I, I'm trying to click well, on. Maybe it's on now. That's a couple of people. I mean, I was doing your old that's so don't worry about it <laughs> well, i'm so excited you're going to be able to hear well this week <laughs> well I, you know i've got it all set up in the living room or dining room here and i don't know i was annoyed about what happened on thursday so i put the bluetooth off on my iphone would that have anything to do with it yeah. oh it might yeah okay okay i'll go back and do work on that Okay. Don't, don't call your meeting about it. We'll keep yeah. going. <laughs> okay. When I'm at your place sometime this week, then we'll look at it again. Thank you, Ed. Okay. Let's say push out. I'm just going to run to the back and ring the bell while Pete and Elsie are chatting with Elaine. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. There was congestion right at my door, so, but it was like, well, certainly, you know, except. Um, I 
I don't know what to get here. Well, we've got. Let's put it on there. No. Good morning, everyone. We definitely are lopsided today. Yeah. We're very lopsided today. We're lopsided in two ways. I only have to look at one side of the congregation because it's only people on the left. There's nobody on the right. And there's more people, far more people on Zoom than there are inside the sanctuary. So, no, 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 that's fine. But I well, just want everybody to be able to see how full the sanctuary is. <laughs> Pete and Elsie and Elaine didn't leave me alone. So let's welcome the Holy Spirit and invite his presence here to be with us. here into this physical and virtual space and into the inner sanctuary of our heart. <clears throat> Help us to open that space to you freely so that you can be there with us in that place and we can have fellowship together. And in being with you, we can be changed and transformed. Amen. I hope that you can see things on the screen, people on Zoom. Thanks, Dale. Let's, I will read the affirmation and then I will put the petition up after it. And the petition is something that we can read all together. I've put the uh, television in the sanctuary on mute, so we won't all be disturbed by all of your voices coming at different times, but everybody will feel like we are saying it together, okay? The affirmation. The beloved of the Lord oh, rests Lord. in safety. <laughs> the high God surrounds him all day long. The beloved rests on his shoulders. And now together. Hear my cry, O oh Lord. Lord. Listen to my prayer. To my prayer. From the end of the, the earth, end of I, the call earth I call when my heart is faint. Heart Lead me to the rock that is higher than I am. For you are my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me abide in your tent forever. Find refuge under the shelter of your wings. May you find shelter under the wings of the Lord in whatever situation you are in, whether you are on Zoom or in the sanctuary. I wish that for you 
equally. We are still looking at the idea of power, but I am continuing to follow the liturgical calendar that's inside the book that I follow, A Guide to Prayer for All Who Seek God. And this week, the theme is Come and Rest a While. And I found a reading in here which intersects with the idea of power in what I re- what I heard this morning. Actually, it was a podcast that Kathleen forwarded on to Elaine and myself. And it was very interesting to, to think about the ideas of power. And I will incorporate some of those in what I share next week. But one of the ideas was that the power that Christ demonstrates is a power that opens up his space to more people. He opens up the space to different voices and welcomes them in so that people who are different than we are, are still welcome. Rather than closing the space and making the space singular for people who are like us. So Jesus doesn't close the space, but he opens it up. That's what he does with his power. So there is that theme in this reading that I've chosen for today, and I thought that's why I would share it with you. Spirituality includes seeing our work as more than making a living, as important as that is. Work becomes a genuine opportunity for service, a way of contributing to other people's lives. Spirituality is the responsibility we show our surroundings and our environment, the respect we have, for our forests, mountains, rivers, lakes, and seashores. It especially involves our attitude toward our everyday life, the way we spend our time. Are we merely wasting time or killing time? Or are we attempting to discover sacred dimensions of life all around us? In a basic sense, spirituality is about the quality of our relationships the ways we care for each other, including the ways we welcome those who are different from us into our lives and families. All the great spiritual traditions agree that spirituality encompasses all those dimensions of our lives that make us human. That is, not only prayer and worship, but our work, play, sexuality, gifts, talents, and limitations, too. Spirituality is influenced for the Christian in a most significant way by the person and ministry of Jesus, the sacred scriptures which tell his story, and the life of the ongoing community that bears his name. Through Jesus, we have been given an awareness that our time on this earth is sacred, that we share a sacred journey that our God has entered human history and taken on a human face. Christian spirituality includes the many ways throughout history that Christian individuals and communities have responded and continue to respond to the awareness of God's transforming love. That was written by Edward Selmer and it's in his book called Mentoring. I'm always looking to try and incorporate hymns that are related to the texts and the messages that we're, the themes that we're following. This is a hymn that was written by Charles Wesley, and it would be familiar to, I think, several of you. Uh, And I could have chosen to play it on the piano, but I found a really nice organ accompaniment on my Spotify account. And so I thought that I would play the accompaniment accompaniment and we could sing along with it and everybody can sing or you can just listen if you want to and you can read the words if you don't want to sing. What I did discover this morning when I tried to play the hymn on my speaker and sing it is that it's in a very high pitch. I pulled out the hymnal and I found that it's exactly the same pitch and so if you're not a soprano or a tenor the higher notes might be difficult I thought about trying to play it on the piano and transposing it down a few keys. 
but there's not enough time for me to practice to make it something worthy that you would want to listen to. So I'm going to play the accompaniment anyway. It's too, if it's too difficult for you to sing, don't worry about that. Just enjoy it as you are able to. And I am just trying to make one adjustment. Just making one adjustment on my screen because it impacts the recording and I don't want the picture that I've got on my computer to cover the words for people in the recording. So let's hope and pray that this all works well together again. There is a brief introduction and then the organ plays all four verses. And for those of you who are interested, the tune is Beecher. There are several tunes that you could sing this hymn words to by Charles Wesley, but uh, I've chosen this one. was for you on Zoom, but it was wonderful here inside the sanctuary. You may be seated. So we're going to go into small groups again. Uh, I will create the groups for Zoom in just a moment uh, before you go into your small groups. One of the things that we're going to touch on today in the sermon is the word of beginnings, beginnings. So I wonder, have you begun something new recently? Or if you haven't begun something new, what's the first beginning that you can remember in your life? 
The first time you remember something that was the beginning of a series of things that happened. So either have you begun something new or your first beginning you can remember. Will you also read the scripture later or should I ask Pete or Elsie? No, that's fine. Okay, okay. That'd be great. Okay, they're going to be joining us again shortly. There we go. Okay, I think I've got my ducks in a row. My TV is not muted, so I can hear the people on Zoom. I've got my list of the different groups. Uh, so we'll start with the people on Zoom, and then we'll go to the one group that we've got here in the sanctuary. The first group is, uh, I think you were together again last week, uh, my Elaine and Rosemary and Arnie and Wanda. <laughs> yes, we were indeed. <laughs> well, so, and, 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 and you know what, our, our time was cut off just as Elaine was going to say something fascinating about politics, so I'm hoping I'll be in the same room next week. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> back to our, our prayer requests, please. Uh, Rosemary would, it would like us to pray for Chris and Karen, who are both not well, and although Chris's pain is less, uh, it, it is really quite terrible pain, so let's pray for Chris and Karen. Uh, Rosemary had wonderful memories, uh, incredibly vivid of her first day at school. And uh, Elaine also remembers her first day at, at school, particularly going into boarding school and making, and making her bed on her first day. We'd like to also pray for this uh, convoy of truckers and pray that, there, that it is a, always a peaceful protest, peaceful and respectful. We'd also like to pray for our leaders in Canada uh, we're having a conversation that justice is a, is a Christian value, and I think some, some of our uh, leaders in Canada may certainly need a little support from above. And I'd like to pray for the Patel family, who was the tremendously unfortunate family who froze in Manitoba trying to cross the U.S. border in minus 30 degree weather. And I pray that it never happens again and that uh, we, everybody involved, um, takes a step back and thinks about what they're doing. Horrendous situation. And I'd also like to pray for all the snowbirds and the travelers this time of year. And I'd like to pray for the 4-Hers who are all busily preparing their speeches for next Saturday when they give their speeches. Thank you very much, Wanda. And the next group is Brenda and Joan and Ralph and Jordan. Yes, um, prayers for Lori and, uh, and Neil. Uh, both of their first cousins have been diagnosed with cancer. Jen is 51 and Bill is 64. And prayers for Evelyn Winkler, who is home from the hospital and her daughter is there looking after them. And we'll pray for a, a speedy recovery for her. She had her elbow operated on. And Brenda prayed for, for peace, for all the unrest that's in the world right now. And Jordan is, is just so busy with her little sons these days, and they're very active. Prayers for her to have of patience. And for Brenda's son, Austin, who, who is still healing from the, the motorbike accident. And uh, the new beginnings, Ralph and I had a new beginning when we moved here. And uh, we have prayers to fulfill God's calling, to feel that we're needed and to meet the needs of, of others too. And I believe that's our prayers today. Thank you very much, Joan. The last group is Liz and Dale and Kathleen. 
guess I'll report. Um, we also requested prayers about the trucker convoy uh, and especially for leaders to be uh, able to deal with abusive elements well and to be able to bring opposing viewpoints together and, and make peace. And Liz's sister-in-law, Lori, is having a spinal surgery on Wednesday, February 2nd. They're from Vernon and they're driving to Vancouver where it's going to happen at the Lionsgate Hospital. So pray for a successful surgery. Thank you, Dale. Uh, I have one more uh, prayer request to add. And this is for a friend of Rhonda's. Uh, her name is Emily. And Emily has just uh, taken in a 17 year old boy who she says is a Christian. And they will be focusing on finishing his grade 12 and continuing to make good choices so that he has control over his future outcomes. So we want to pray for Emily and for this young man that she's taken into her house to help him with the rest of his schooling and development. Let's pray together. Oh, sorry, I forgot our group in the sanctuary. I was part of the group, so it's all in my mind, and Elaine is going to report for us. Yes, our group uh, also have the uh, truck convoy in our prayers that uh, the Lord will just enter into that, that whole uh, situation. And, uh, and New Beginnings, we had quite a discussion about uh, marriage, what a new beginning that is, and motherhood, and, um, and diaries. Uh, a new beginning for me is always uh, starting a, a new year in a diary, but also starting a new five-year diary. <laughs> it's, uh, it's wonderful to be able to read back on new beginnings. And, and um, prayers for... Uh, for new beginnings, new relationships uh, in our families that uh, that these are so uh, are so important today. And I, I believe that was all. Thank you. I think so. No, you can go ahead and sit because I, I might, you know, I don't know how long I'll pray. <laughs> Elaine agreed to read scripture, so she's going to come back up in a, in, a, in a little bit, but let's pray together and she can sit down while we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you make space for us. Love divine, all loves excelling. Your love is very spacious. I wonder how you do it, how you welcome each and every one, regardless of where they've been or where they're at now. If they knock on your door, you open the door. Thank you that you've opened the door to us and help us keep our doors open to others so that the spaces that we inhabit are spaces that are welcoming. Fill us with your spirit that we might be able to do just that with those that are around us. May we be people who speak hope and not division. I pray as the Freedom Convoy in Ottawa is making its voice heard, Lord, that people would be bound by their own choices to be peaceful and respectful. I pray that you would give the civic authorities and the police their wisdom as they might deal with people who have opposing viewpoints and maybe some conflict, oral conflict, maybe even abusive elements. I pray, Lord, that you would help to keep people's temperatures to a place where they can listen to each other and not speak so loudly and so hotly that they get out of control. I pray that justice would be served, Lord, 
that you would help us to do our part in trying to make justice a reality and that you would also give wisdom to the leaders in Ottawa, the leaders in our provinces, the leaders in our cities, the leaders in our communities, the leaders in our homes, Lord, to work for justice in all of those places, the leaders in our place of employment, that they would also seek justice. We pray, Lord, for peace, not only here in Canada, but also in the rest of the world, especially where there is so much unrest. Places like Syria, Iraq, the border between Ukraine and Russia. Lord, where people are in conflict over ideas, over ownership, over things. Lord, I pray that you would bring your spirit of peace and understanding. Lord, for those who have left difficult places like that to try and find more peace for their families, I pray that you would give them perseverance and wisdom and strength. We pray for mercy on the Patels and comfort for their family in this horrendous loss. And I pray, Lord, that our borders would be open enough that people who were desperate would find a place where others would welcome them. For those who are traveling, Lord, we pray that you would give them traveling mercies. For those who are holidaying, help them to have a, a time of being away from stress and pressure and find joy in their relaxation. Help the 4-Hers as they prepare, Lord, for their speeches next week. Give them wisdom and may they draw upon the experiences of others as they learn how to speak well. And for those, Lord, who are unwell, we pray for your healing for their bodies. We pray for peace for their spirits. We pray specifically for Chris and for Karen. Lord, that you would bring their bodies back to full health. We pray for Jen and for Bill and for Neil and Lori's families as they receive this diagnosis of cancer. I pray that you would give them strength of will and that they would draw on you for power. Bring healing to Evelyn Winkler and her, her elbow surgery and strength to her daughter who is helping her in her recovery. Bring healing to Austin. May his rest bring his bones back to the place where they should be and for his muscles and his ligaments to grow well again. And as he experiences therapy, Lord, I pray that you would give him patience and perseverance. And we pray for wisdom for the doctors as they operate this week for Lori on her spinal surgery. May she have relief. May you give guidance. And may the outcome be successful, we ask, Lord God. And for those of us in families who are just struggling because life is a challenge, I pray that you would give us patience, wisdom, and strength. We pray specifically for Jordan, that she would delight in her sons. She would find great joy in the tasks that she has, and that you would give her insight into the incredible privilege that she has and the things that she is investing in those lives as they grow with her and because of her good care. And we pray too, Lord, for Emily as she takes in this new to her person, a new beginning for her having a 17-year-old that she's helping to continue his development. May you give her wisdom. May you demonstrate your grace to her and may she be a good influence for this young man as he moves forward to help his life develop well make our space lord yours may we may we revel lord in the fact that we are in a sacred space when your life is with us 
and when we are connected to you and that we don't have to find a separation between the sacred and the secular, but it all comes under your authority and your guidance. We are grateful for how you have been with us and will continue to be with us. Amen. Okay, I'm just going to move things around on my screen here again. I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. I think that works. Hope that's working. Let's read our mission statement together. Please stand with me. I am a child of God, therefore, I am somebody. The power of Christ is within me. This week, I chose something that is not the Apostles' Creed for us to recite. It's very short, but this is a part of Christian history, and scholars are not clear on when this became a part of the Christian church. But it's just an opportunity for us to be able to declare, declare glory to God. So let's read this doxology together. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the, Son, and to the Holy Spirit. And to the Holy Spirit. As it was, As it was in, the beginning, in the beginning, is now, is now and, ever, and shall ever shall be, world, world without end. Without end. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I hope that gives you a sense that you are part of something much bigger than just us here in Dale Mead. For those of you who want to give to the church's needs, I think you already know these things, but I just put them here for your reminding. And Elaine is going to come forward and read the scripture. Is that good? You can take your mask off, I think, to read. And um, you can, yeah, you better come from here because then the people on Zoom can hear you better. And I'm just going to have to, let's see, should we try this? That's perfect. That's fine. Okay. <clears throat> I'm just going to have to fold the screen when we need to. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 13. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things through whom he also made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels to the extent that he has inherited a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have fathered you, and again, I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him, and regarding the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But regarding the sun, he says, your throne, God, is forever and ever. And the scepter of righteousness is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God has appointed you 
with the oil of joy above your companions. And you, O Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they all will wear out like a garment, and like a robe you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will also be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This will be a very interesting week. Should I turn the TV a little bit more? It's okay. Um, because it's not a typical sermon. I feel like I am welcoming you to come to Bible study with me. We've been studying some Greek words together, and we're going to continue to do that today. We've looked at exousia and dunamis and megaleotes, and today we're going to look at a new one. And this word is called arche in Greek, and it occurs 58 times in the New Testament, and the TR beside that means the textus receptus, so it's the received text of the Greek New Testament that scholars are agreed on is the best copy that we have or the amalgamation of all of the texts that we have. So arche appears 58 times, but Arche is one of those words, like many words in English, that has more than just one meaning. And I've started with a simple one at the top. It can mean the extremity of a thing, so the far reach of something. It can mean the beginning, and that can be either the absolute beginning, so the beginning of all things, or it can be a relative beginning, meaning the beginning of a thing that is being spoken of. It can also mean the first persons or things in a series or the leader. It can also mean the active cause. And the last meaning is principality or power. And this is probably the meaning that drew us into Arche in the first place, because we're looking at all the words of the New Testament in the series that have something to do with power. And I thought it was so interesting that this word that can both mean principality can also mean beginning or extremities. And so today I'm just going to talk about the first, all of the ones except for the last one, because the last one is a little bit more complicated, so we're saving it for next week. Part of what I do when I do word studies is to create these wonderful pie charts. No, that's not what I do. Is to find out these meanings. So in addition to just knowing those meanings, this pie chart represents how many times of those 58 times in the New Testament these definitions are used. So the, the larger the color, the more time that word is used by that particular definition. And you can see up at the top this orange is very small, so the meaning for RK of the extremity of something only appears two times in the New Testament. Down here, the yellow one, uh, which is the active cause of something, only occurs once in the New Testament. Principality that we're going to talk about next week occurs 16 times. The idea of RK being first in a series shows up seven times in Scripture, but beginning seems to be the greatest meaning that the word RK is used for 16 times as an absolute beginning and 23 times as a relative beginning. Now, some people might think, oh, this is just fanciful little trivia. And maybe that is, maybe I'm a little bit obsessed sometimes with a trivial pursuit, but I think it also helps us understand what is significant for the Bible if they're using it many times or if they only use it once. And that might color how we leave scripture, what our impression of what scripture is teaching us. 
In addition to the definitions of the word RK, we can also ask who uses this word? Because the using of the word by particular authors can also color what we understand about how that word is used. For example, Elaine might always use the word diary, 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 diary. That tells us something about Elaine. And Pete might always talk about the wheat and the fields and the barn and the cars. And Elsie might always talk about her children and how wonderful it is to be a mother. That tells us something about those people, but it also might tell us something about the means of the words that they use and that use coloring their definitions of those words. So I put on here a little bar graph which shows you where sometimes this word RK is found in scripture. Now, those of you who are really quick at this will realize that RK is Greek and the New Testament was written in Greek. And on the far left, I've got the Torah and the writings which come from the Old Testament. And this is because there is also a Greek translation of the Old Testament, which I've referred to in the past before as the Septuagint. So there are a few uses of the word RK in the Septuagint in the Torah, which is the law, the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then three times it's found in the writings. The writings are the books like Job and Psalms. So they're not the prophets, but they're more the historical books and the wisdom literature. But I'm more focused, of course, on what's in the New Testament. So you can see there is some use of it in Matthew. There's more in Mark, less in Luke. John uses it more than the other gospel writers. Then we've got the book of Acts, which is written by the same author as Luke. So you could put those two together. But then you look at Paul and something jumps up at you. That Paul is using this word more than anybody else in the New Testament. It's also a significant word to some degree in Hebrews, just mentioned in Peter. But John, these are the epistles of John. And the epistles of John, we believe, are also written by the same writer as the Gospel of John, the beloved disciple of Jesus. And so it's interesting because we could put that orange for John and the red for John together, and they would almost equal Paul's use of the word RK. Jude mentions it. And then it's also found four times in the book of Revelation, also written by John. Very interesting. John uses this word RK, and Paul uses this word RK very significantly. And the way that they use it and the meaning that they use it for is also significant in our understanding of that word and of what it means. So in the book of Acts, and this is the word RK, which means the extremity of something. The word RK happens twice, but it's referring to the very same thing. It's referring to this dream that Peter had, where a sheet came down from heaven, held by the four corners. It's usually translated as corners, as you can see in this translation. He saw heaven opened and an object, something like a large sheet descending, being let down to earth by its four corners. Well, that word for four corners is the extremities. So it's the far part of the sheet was held out and the sheet came down and there were animals in it. And if you're familiar with this dream of Peter's, the significant thing is that God was telling to Peter things that have been unclean in the past are now clean. And it was really a metaphor for Peter to understand God is welcoming the Gentiles into the kingdom of God. Anyway. We're going to find a lot of these little rabbit trails as we go through RK and how it's used in the New Testament, but try to find some application uh, at the end that's significant for us. Now I'm going to move on to talking about beginnings, and we're going to start with absolute beginnings, and I'm not going to show you all of the references uh, where this word is found, because that would put everybody to sleep, including myself, uh, but just a few that I selected that I thought were, were very, very interesting. The book of John begins with this verse, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was fully God. Now, this is very interesting, and I spoke about the Septuagint because there is a relation between John and Genesis, because if you remember, the very first verse of the Bible talks about a similar idea and begins with the very same phrase, in the beginning 
God created the heavens and the earth. So both of these, the Old Testament and this Gospel of John, start with the beginning, and they start with the beginning of both the Word and the Word creating the heavens and the earth. In Hebrews, this is also underlined for us, and we read it today in our scripture reading. You founded the earth in the beginning, Lord, and the heavens are the works of your hands. The Lord was at the beginning. And when the writer of Hebrews does this, and if you recall from what Elaine read, there is the comparison between how God treats angels and how God treats his son, Jesus. And here in Hebrews 1.10, because it says, you founded the earth in the beginning, Lord, and the heavens are the work, works of your hands. There is a joining together of the deification of Jesus. So this verse is helping us to understand more clearly that Jesus truly is divine. And he was the one that the apostles recognized was responsible for the creation of the world. So Jesus wasn't just a simple person, but he also had the creative power of God in his ability. So I'm not going to read Hebrews 1, 1 to 12, because we already did that for our scripture today. And then in Psalm 102, we can see this theme, which is where the writer of Hebrews has pulled these verses from. In earlier times, you established the earth, the skies are your handiwork. So these scriptures that are written so far apart from each other in very different contexts and at different cultural times are joined together in this theme of God doing the creating. And Hebrews is demonstrating for us that Christ was at the absolute beginning of it. John, who started with, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, in his epistle, focuses on that theme many times, the idea of the beginning. He starts his epistle with, this is what we proclaim to you, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at, and our hands have touched concerning the word of life. And then he goes on in the rest of his epistle to talk about Jesus and his teachings. But he's saying here in the beginning, we touched him, we saw him, we were with him. But he was the one who was from the beginning. And he was the one who has created all of this. He repeats this theme again in chapter 2, verse 13. I'm writing to you, fathers, that you have known him who has been from the beginning, I am writing to you, young people, that you have conquered the evil one. And one more in John's gospel, it's not just God who has an absolute beginning, but Jesus also talks about somebody else and what their beginning was. He's talking to people that he's preaching to and he sees they don't accept his message. People like the Pharisees and the Sadducees saying to them, you people are from your father, the devil, and you want to do what your father desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not uphold the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he lies, he speaks according to his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. In John's gospel, he also, or sorry, in his epistle, he also repeats this idea that it's not just Jesus who has a beginning and an influence, but also the devil. The one who practices sin is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was revealed to destroy the works of the devil. So both of these have an absolute beginning, both God. And then the devil seems to have his own absolute beginning when the lies and the sin start. RK is also used as a relative beginning. So the beginning of something or a series. 
for nation will rise up in arms against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and there will be famines. These are but the beginning of birth pains. So this is talking about a tribulation that is to come or at least was to come at the time when Jesus said this. Very interesting that this is a beginning. It will start and it will progress. Jesus also is part of a relative beginning, his miracles. At the marriage in Cana, Jesus began to do signs. This beginning of his signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed him. So there is a relative beginning that takes place with Jesus acts himself. And then the idea in the first of a series, this verse in Colossians 1.18 is talking about Jesus himself being the head of the church and also Jesus being the beginning of something else. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. So not only is Jesus the absolute beginning in the creation of the world, but now we also see that he is the first of many that will follow to rise from the dead. He experienced death. He went into death and then he came back again and he is the beginning of those who will rise from the dead. And so more will follow him. In the book of Revelation, there are many uses of this word, four or five, that talk about this concept of a beginning in a series. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come the Almighty. You can see this is where the Gloria Patri also is influenced, what we recited today, what is, what was, and what shall be. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give water to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. (laughs) And then in Revelation 22, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I took this photo this morning right here in Dale Meet on my phone because we've taken this theme, maybe from this book in Revelation. I don't know where it came, if that's what somebody had in mind, but Jesus is definitely known by this. And if you don't know, those are two Greek letters right there on that sign. The A, like our alphabet, is the word, the letter alpha in the Greek alphabet. And the other sign beside that A looking letter, which is an A in English, but it's really the alpha of the Greek alphabet, is the omega. Because omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. And that's why Jesus says that he is the alpha and the omega, just using the idea from the Greek alphabet that he is the beginning of it. And he is the end of it. He is the beginning of everything. And he is the end of everything. So we could easily put A and Z on there and just use the metaphor from the English alphabet that Jesus is the A and the Z. One definition of RK that's used very sparsely only once in scripture is the active cause It also happens in the book of Revelation, written by John, who frequently uses this word RK, but he uses it here to say that it's the thing that begins something, that starts something, that causes something to happen. It has the power to cause it to happen. And this is the beginning of a letter that's going to be written to one of the churches. At the beginning of Revelation, there are several letters that are written to different churches to make prophetic words to them. For them to do something, to be moved by what the angel is saying to them. And this is opened with, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the origin of the creation of God, says this. And so here you can see in this translation, Arche, as it's used here, is the origin 
of the creation of God. It's the one that's causing the creation of God. This is who Jesus is. This is who the Alpha and the Omega is, that he is the active cause. Now, when I was reading about this in one of the lexicons, I also discovered that in a proto gospel or a pseudo gospel, and I was really trying to find the original source, but I wasn't able to, but I think the abbreviations in the lexicon mean the evangel or the gospel of Nicodemus, which isn't a gospel that is in our Bible. So people think that it's a, you know, apocryphal, an additional gospel. But in that gospel, there is an interesting phrase because the word arche is also used, but it's not used in the active cause of God. It's actually used as Satan being an active cause. Because in this apocryphal gospel, it says that Satan is the arche or the beginning of death and that he is the root of sin. I thought that was very interesting to see Satan being somehow an active cause, just like God or Jesus here in Revelation is this active cause, that Jesus is the one who is the origin of creation. But opposing that, Satan is the one who is the origin of death. He is the one that caused death, and he is the one who is at the root of sin. So that's my word study that I brought you with me on today. And what I'm hoping that you will come away from this with is that Jesus is with us and has been with us from the very beginning because he is that active cause of all of creation. But he didn't just stay there. He didn't stay up in the heavens being that active cause. But rather, he made his choice to come and be with us and to experience everything that we experience, and then to actually submit to death. In that sense, he was submitting himself to this other seeming active cause of the devil, who was the root of sin and the cause of death. And Jesus submitted himself to that. I find this fascinating because he is the most powerful. He is the one who is greater than any other. And yet he made the choice to submit to this death. But the purpose of that was only for us. It wasn't for himself. It was so that he could bring us to a place where we could be with him and we wouldn't be subjected to that death. So that he could be that first in our series, the firstborn from the dead. And we will be the secondborn and the thirdborn and the fourthborn and the fifthborn from the dead because of what he has done. And so we believe that he is the beginning and that he is the end and that he is embraced us and scooped us up with him so that we too, like him, can be saved from the death that was started from the enemy of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, allow your spirit to reveal to us the mysteries of you, the mysteries of the cosmos, the mysteries of the heavens and the earth, the mysteries of the inner thoughts of the Trinity. And as we come to an awareness of the fact that the one who is the active cause of all creation was also the one who chose to submit to another power in order that we might be with him in glory and through his resurrection defeated the enemy. Fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit and may we walk today in the knowledge that your spirit is enough for us. 
May you give us the strength that we have to endure our pains, our challenges, our injustices. And may we rejoice because we know the Alpha and the Omega, the one who is from the very beginning always been there, and the one who at the very end is sitting at the right hand of the Father, as God the Father has said, come and sit here beside me while I make your enemies a footstool for you. We give our praise to Jesus, this Alpha, this RK, this beginning, who has embraced us and welcomed us into your presence. Amen. May you go this week in the knowledge that Jesus embraces you, that he loves you, that he empowers you, and that he is with you. Amen. Um, a couple of announcements. Uh, just a reminder, we are going to have our annual general meeting sometime in April. I am still hoping in the month of March to make a trip to dispense eyeglasses. So I'm hoping that it will be possible depending on what the world situation is with COVID. Uh, also, I made a request earlier this week uh, to have the board support me in a professional development opportunity. Uh, I have been using a uh, survey, a questionnaire, with people who get married that I officiate at their, at their weddings as a part of premarital counseling. Uh, it's called the Prepare and Rich. And what it does is it asks people questions and in their responses to those questions, it's a fairly long questionnaire. Uh, it helps you understand how two people might come into conflict with each other or where their areas of weakness and communication with each other might come or what challenges they might face. And it's a way of being able to help prepare people ahead before they get into a marriage relationship to make sure that things will go as, as well as they possibly can. This questionnaire is also possible to be used in situations where somebody will adopt a child. So you can understand that child and the family, how that gets along. And it can also be used to enrich a marriage later on in life. So if people want more guidance or counseling. Uh, and I have actually used this in the past, but not as a facilitator. But a friend of mine has uh, been a go-between for us, uh, for me to be able to use the questionnaire with people who want to get married. And I'm now going to do the training of a facilitator so that I can officially be a facilitator and use this in my own right, rather than having to ask somebody else to help me. So I'm grateful to the board for their support in that. Um, Wanda, do you have any other announcements for us? Thanks so much, Wes, for all, all of those good announcements. No, I was just going to share a very brief memory. One of my first memories of uh, Sunday school at Dale Mead Church was with uh, Elaine McKinnon as our Sunday school teacher and Faye Gosling, who taught us about Alpha and Omega being the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. So little memory came up throughout uh, your service today. No other uh, comments. Thank you so very much for an insightful service and everybody have a great week. Thank you so much, everybody, for being with us. I will leave the Zoom room open. If people on Zoom want to chat with each other, I will turn my microphone off so you don't have to hear us. And I will mute the television so we won't be able to hear you if you want to have a conversation together. The Lord bless you all this week. It's delightful to see you. Take care, everybody. You too, Wanda. Thank Have a good week, everybody. See you all. Bye-bye. Bye for Bye now. now.